Right, I think I'll go ahead and start. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to this uh, cross workshop on uh, aspects of databases. Uh, we have two talks uh, today, a longer talk and a shorter one. We will start with a longer talk. Uh, I'm delighted to introduce uh, Wang Chiu Tan, who's currently the head of research at Megagon Labs uh, in Mount, at, at Mountain View. Uh, Wang Chiu received her PhD from the University of Pennsylvania and then became a faculty member at UC Santa Cruz. We had the benefit and privilege to have her as our colleague for a good uh, more than 12 years or so. Uh, but then she left for bigger and better things and uh, for the past few years she has been with Megagon Labs and as I said currently she is the head of research there. And Wang Xu is uh, well known for uh, her work on data provenance, uh, data integration, and now natural language processing. She's an ACM fellow. She has received numerous uh, awards and distinctions, including two Test of Times award. Uh, and uh, last year, she, she received the VLDB 2019 uh, Women in Database Research Award. Today, she's going to talk to us about subjective databases and uh, once you the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Fukuan. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> thank you for the kind introduction. So today I'm going to talk about subjective databases. Uh, this was actually work done a while back, and uh, uh, but many of the projects that we have in Magagon Labs kind of uh, uh, um, grew out of this uh, research. So, oops. Um, so first of all, what is subjective data? Subjective data refers to uh, things like product reviews or hotel reviews, uh, forum posts, uh, social media, tweets, question and answer forums, or even images that you see on a web and video. So there are lots of subjective uh, data out there. Now you may be wondering why uh, Megagon Labs is uh, working on uh, subjective data. And that's because uh, Megagon Labs is actually a research arm of Recruit Holdings. And this is a huge uh, human and uh, resources lifestyle company in Japan. And they have over more than 200 online services, right? Including, you know, from domains such as uh, dining, travel, uh, to real estate, and so on. Uh, they also own subsidiaries outside of Japan, like Glassdoor, you may have heard of, and Indeed.com, and also in Europe, like Treatwell. So there is a lot of uh, subjective data and uh, um, structured data in recruit holdings, and that's why our interest uh, in this area. So, uh, well, subjective data, um, from subjective data, uh, what we want to get out of it is uh, are all the experiences and opinions that people put into writing all these tweets and comments and reviews about products, right? So that's one goal. Uh, here's an example. Uh, I reached a hotel by cab, check-in was very smooth uh, and so on. Very spacious bathroom, lots of uh, provided toiletries. So the phrases highlighted in bold are the subjective comments, right? Like check-in was very smooth. It's very um, subjective because it's what the person thinks right, and very spacious bathroom and so on. Uh, so we want to mine all these subjective opinion and, out there and to be able to query them, right, through what we call subjective search queries, right, and we have a lot of projects, um, uh, uh, several projects at Megagon Labs in the areas of uh, experience mining, knowledge-based construction, salient fact extraction, Extreme Reader, which is uh, basically summarization of uh, product reviews, and also uh, exploration and analytics of this uh, subjective data. Um, so uh, back to uh, the work that I was going to talk about, if you look at uh, the travel domain, for example, this is from booking.com, right? The way you would search today is when you look up the website, uh, the first thing you need to enter is uh, three criteria: where you want to go to, when, and who is going, right? And after you press the search button, you make, uh, get the following screen where you get a list of hotels ranked by booking.com, uh, along with uh, perhaps you can also pull out a map on the site to show you all the hotels that are listed. And on the left, you see um, here, some more filters that are provided by booking.com. 
that will help you narrow down the search further, right? So, um, but what you take away from not just booking.com, all the travel uh, portals you see out there, right, is that they expose as many attributes as they think are important, right? The schema or the attributes they can think of is fixed a priori. Sometimes they may vary location to location, but these are all a fixed set of attributes that they think about ahead of time to present to you. And the results they give you are also very objective, right? Uh, a result that is returned either satisfies your criteria or it doesn't satisfy your criteria. So um, here are uh, some examples of subjective query that, queries that we would like to be able to pose against such, such travel system. For example, when I was looking for hotels uh, in Lisbon, right, I was really looking for hotels with clean room near the IST Congress Center in Lisbon, Portugal. And that was like two years ago. Uh, <laughs> I'm not look, I haven't been looking for hotels for a long time. So, um, so to, to see whether the hotels uh, satisfy these criteria, I go through the booking.com process and I still need to look at the reviews to read the reviews to see whether the hotels uh, you know, uh, really have clean rooms or and they, whether they're near the IST Congress Center, right? In other domains, you may want to ask for restaurants which are romantic uh, or decently priced, whatever decently means, it's very subjective, right? Or in terms of the jobs, uh, which Recruit is uh, big about, right? Is about, for example, people coming to the system and asking very vague queries like, I want to work for companies uh, in cu with cutting edge AI technology and uh, gives great benefits, right? So these are all very uh, subjective uh, criteria. Um, so by subjective, I mean uh, opinions, uh, uh, you know, opinions that are influenced by uh, people's feelings, taste, and so on, all right? So uh, we are not the first to recognize that, uh, um, you know, a lot of the queries are subjective. For example, uh, Macaulay and Young in the that, that, that 2016 paper already recognized 20% of the product queries. I think these are, these are from the Amazon uh, data set, right? 20% of the queries were labeled as subjective by, by human workers. We also did our own uh, uh, digging research, right? And here I uh, list uh, a few domains. And what we did was we uh, crowdsourced uh, according to each domain, we ask uh, crowdsource workers uh, to write some queries that they think they will ask against uh, these domains. And then we very conservatively picked out uh, attributes that we think are subjective in these queries. And you can see for the hotel domain, a large uh, percentage of subject uh, attributes are subjective right, along with uh, restaurants and so on, vacation, right? So uh, in across all these domains, a large number of uh, attributes, uh, uh, queries that people ask contains a lot of subjective attributes. So um, in terms of how you think about um, these uh, subjective uh, data and queries, here is a, a, a four square uh, quadrant that maybe will help put, the, uh, perspective, put some perspective. Um, so on the bottom left uh, corner, you see the objective query against objective data. This is what uh, people are very used to today. You have your relational database management system with uh, tables and you post very structured queries against these tables, right? Uh, like give me all hotels in the area London with price less than 180 pounds per night. Okay, oops. Um, uh, up here, you can also have subjective queries against objective data. So here we are talking more about people posing more natural language-like queries against uh, uh, relational, for example, relational uh, data management systems. And there has been a lot of work in this area, right? We also have uh, objective queries against subjective data, right? Think about lots of reviews out there and people still want to post and get answers to queries like, give me all the restaurants uh, whose average food rating is more than uh, 4.9. So for this, you have to do some groundwork uh, to understand the reviews, somehow uh, fit all these reviews into some numerical uh, scale, right? Before you can answer such queries. Uh, uh, subjective databases uh, is really looking at this uh, quadrant here 
where we have uh, subjective queries against subjective data. So subjective queries, meaning queries are in natural language form or in uh, natural language phrases against, uh, uh, against um, uh, subjective data such as uh, product reviews or hotel reviews. By the way, uh, please feel free to interrupt and ask me any questions you may have. Right. So um, why is this, uh, why is answering subjective queries over subjective data a hard problem? Well, uh, the experiences you see on, in all these reviews are very subjective and personal to begin with, right? And they are um, written in a variety of, of ways, different ways. And, and they're written in text, not in a database. Uh, uh, their meanings are often uh, uh, imprecise, right? being uh, language and is nuanced sometimes. And it's hard to really model this in a data management system. Right, uh, I'm gonna give you here a very simple example on how uh, people uh, describe breakfast, right? So you can see phrases like breakfast average, breakfast was very delicious and had many options. Uh, food was great for breakfast. And I'm saying this is actually a very simple example. Uh, you see very, uh, um, uh, you see a lot of reviews where you, you wouldn't, even a human wouldn't know sometimes how to interpret this. And let me give you this very funny example here, uh, where it's a review of, uh, from TripAdvisor of uh, Tumon Beach, where this reviewer was um, somehow complaining that the beach was too sandy, right? Uh, but it has clear water. So for us, we know uh, it's actually really good that the beaches are sandy, but uh, not for this reviewer. So you can see that the, the, the opinions are very subjective and uh, sometimes we also have to take into account uh, who is writing the review, right? So um, back to uh, subjective databases, uh, we have on one hand, all these subjective data, I think, uh, reviews. And on the other hand, um, queries that are coming in, uh, such as hot I want hotels with really clean rooms and is a romantic getaway. Right? How do we bring the two together so that we can answer the user's queries uh, over this uh, subjective data on, on the left? Um, oops. So uh, I'm gonna talk about the subjective database model that we have and uh, how we process subjective database queries and how uh, touch a little bit upon how we build subjective databases and um, I'm, I'm probably not gonna go through a demonstration, but I'm gonna give you a screenshot here, right? So um, a subjective database schema consists of a bunch of uh, relation schemas, right? Of the following form uh, with a key and a number of attributes. Uh, each of these attributes here can either be uh, objective attributes or subjective attributes. And by objective attributes is what we already know. These are uh, attributes which contain uh, values that are based on facts and are indisputable, indis like phone number, address, uh, the name of the person, right? And subjective attributes are attributes whose values are influenced by the person's beliefs or feelings. Let me give you one example here. For the hotel uh, example, uh, this is an example of a subjective relation schema. Uh, you see hotel name capacity and address and price per night. These are all um, objective attributes. And the last four attributes are the subjective attributes, right? Uh, for every, um, uh, so every subjective attribute, the type is uh, a marker summary. And I'll explain this more in a bit, right? So every subjective attribute uh, is associated with what we call uh, a linguistic domain. Uh, which is a set of phrases, what we call linguistic variations. So let me just pull up the animation here. So uh, for example, room cleanliness uh, can contain all these phrases uh, listed here, quite dirty, very filthy, pretty clean. And these are all phrases that are picked up from uh, the reviews, right? And we group them all together and uh, collective, uh, collected them under uh, room cleanliness. Um, all these different phrases within each uh, linguistic domain are what we call uh, linguistic variations. Right. 
So, um, so a linguistic domain is a set of short linguistic variations that describe the attribute. Uh, and each uh, linguistic, um, uh, each attribute actually is at associated with a marker summary, uh, where a marker summary is simply a set of markers that are taken from the linguistic domain to be meant to be representatives of, uh, of, the, of the attribute. So for example, room cleanliness attribute uh, can have the following marker summary, which consists of four markers. These are phrases from the linguistic domain from very clean to very dirty. So intuitively, these four phrases are meant to um, represent uh, all the variations you can think of in the linguistic domain. So there are two types of marker summaries, uh, uh, linearly ordered and categorical in the, in the subjective database system that we implemented, right? In the linearly ordered case, uh, markers form a linear scale. Um, uh, you can think of a histogram shown on the top right here, right, uh, with all the counts for uh, uh, hotels which are, um, sorry, reviews which are, uh, which indicate that this hotel is very clean, or uh, reviews which indicate that this hotel is very dirty. So uh, phrases, if you see a phrase like rooms are pretty clean in the review, this phrase can contribute in part to one or more markers, right? Because sometimes it's not clear what pretty clean means. Is it very clean or is it average? So they can contribute partially to, to multiple markers. Uh, in contrast, uh, categorical uh, marker summaries, um, uh, by categorical, uh, every phrase in the review can only contribute as a whole uh, to one or more markers, okay, not in part. So for example, here, extra, extravagant old-fashioned bathrooms uh, contributed to the marker, old-fashioned and also luxurious. Okay, so uh, back to this big picture here, uh, what I've essentially described is what is going on in the middle uh, of the picture here with the subjective database schema. So now you can think that in the middle, there is a hotel um, relation, right, shown on the top here, with a bunch of attributes, objective and subjective. Each subjective attribute has marker summaries shown on the bottom here, and there are also uh, linguistic domains associated with each of these attributes, right? And uh, for the remaining of the talk, I'm mostly going to focus about uh, how we answer uh, subjective queries against uh, this uh, subjective database. So um, subjective queries come in a natural language form, like this example shown here, find hotels with cost less than $150 per night, has really clean rooms, and is a romantic getaway, right? So uh, there are lots of uh, work out there on how to translate natural language queries to uh, SQL, SQL queries against uh, the database. Uh, I'm not going to go into that here, and in fact, uh, in the first version of our demo that we built, uh, we immediately assume that uh, we have all these uh, phrases that we picked out and uh, can construct such a query. So uh, in a nutshell, when you get such a query, select star from hotels, price per night is less than 150, has really clean rooms, and is a romantic getaway, right? Uh, we're ready to process, try to interpret these queries against the subjective data maze schema to answer um, answer this, this query, which will be a rank list of hotels. So uh, what is interesting here is that um, you see a mixture of uh, objective predicates, like what you have seen in SQL before, and subjective predicates, like has really clean rooms and is a romantic getaway. So um, a lot of the work here is really done uh, on, on the subjective phrases, right, on how to interpret these phrases into uh, the subjective database schema. So the big picture is shown here. We have the uh, query coming in on the left. We know that these two phrases has really clean rooms and is a romantic getaway are the subjective predicates. So the first step that we do immediately is to uh, interpret these predicates. By interpreting predicates, uh, we mean trying to map these phrases on the left to uh, markers of marker summary 
right, on the, what is shown on the right. Um, I'll go through some of this in some detail, right, has really clean rooms so map to map to the very clean marker of the room cleanliness summary, is a romantic getaway, will map to a disjunction of exceptional service or luxurious bathroom. Okay. So after that, after we get uh, this mapping, we will uh, compute what we call the degrees of truth for each hotel uh, before we aggregate them uh, in the query to form a ranked list of hotels to return uh, to the user. Right. So how do we do a predicate um, uh, interpretation? Right. So uh, just a, a big picture here. Right. What we want to to achieve is the blue part shown here, right? Uh, where these predicates on the subjective predicates on the left are interpreted into markers of marker summary. Okay? And I use this um, uh, funny symbols here to mean a conjunction in a fuzzy sense. Uh, and I'll explain this in a little bit, right? So how do we do a predicate interpretation? There are easy cases, right? And the easy cases con correspond to uh, situations where when the phrase have direct, direct mapping to markers of marker summary. For example, if I asked for hotels with luxurious bathrooms, right? So luxurious, uh, we can find immediately a marker here called luxurious in the marker summary called bathroom. So this is a direct uh, uh, mapping. So you can find this mapping very easily. We call this the EC case. Uh, same for has firm beds, right? You can find firm and bed here. Okay, so this is great. Um, how about has really clean rooms, right? This is slightly more difficult because really clean never really appeared in any of the markers uh, of room cleanliness, which is the closest one. So what do we do here? Right. Uh, and um, also to go one step further um, is the predicate is a romantic getaway none of the phrases can be found in the marker summaries. And in this case, what do we do? Okay. So query predicates can have uh, arbitrary uh, phrases. Uh, so the problem here is when we're given a query predicate P, how do we find the markers best, uh, in a best effort way, interpret uh, the predicate P into markers of the marker summary, right? So there are three uh, methods we use here, one after another, right? The first, we will try the word embedding method. Uh, and then if that fails, we'll find the, use the co-occurrence method. And if that fails, uh, we will fall back to the good old uh, text retrieval method. And I'll explain each of this in, in a little bit more detail in the next slides, right? So the first method is the word embedding method, right? So what this means is really, you look at the predicate P, uh, you um, find the embedding of each token in P, right? This is really what the formulation here is talking about. And you weight it by uh, the IDF of that token uh, according to the frequency of these words uh, that are mentioned in the reviews uh, and sum them up. So this will form a representative uh, representation of P, right? And we find uh, all the uh, all the, uh, what do you call this, all the phrases in the, all the markers and phrases in the linguistic domains that are closest to P according to this measure, where this measure is simply computing the cosine similarity of the representation of this phrase with the representation of P, right? And we will find uh, the corresponding marker of Q with the highest similarity score to P that is above the certain threshold. So if it's not above the certain threshold, that's when we'll go to the uh, second method, uh, which is the co-occurrence method. So, um, oh, I thought I have, okay. Yeah, let me uh, show you uh, an example here, right? So it has really clean rooms, right? Really clean rooms, uh, for example, may, map, may have very high cosine similarity to the phrase very clean here, like for example, 0.92. And this may happen to be the highest one Right, and in this case, because this, uh, this phrase belong to a linguistic domain of the marker, very clean in uh, this room cleanliness uh, marker summary, that's how we know to interpret has really uh, clean rooms into this uh, marker of the marker summary, okay? 
So, and if things fail, we'll go back to the co-occurrence. We go to the second method, which is the co-occurrence method. And this happens for the case when we ask for, is a romantic getaway? We try the word embedding method and none of the um, uh, matchings uh, produce a high, sufficiently high score in terms of cosine similarity. And uh, that's when we use the co-occurrence method. So it, it, the intuition here is that we'll go back to the reviews here to find what are the other phrases that uh, frequently co-occurs with the phrase is a romantic getaway, okay? So let me give you an illustration and I hope I have it. Yeah, here. So this is how we do it, right? We find uh, for is a romantic getaway, you try the word embedding method, it didn't produce uh, any markers with a high enough cosine similarity with this phrase. So we go to the co-occurrence method. And the first thing that is done is to compute the top reviews where the phrase, uh, top positive reviews where the phrase is a romantic getaway occurs in the review, right? It doesn't have to be a direct uh, word by word match, uh, is a, a similarity match again, right? For example, this review is a romantic getaway is a direct match. Uh, for the second review, it's slightly different. It's a really nice romantic getaway, right? Uh, or enjoyed our romantic getaway. So there are variations and we will take them, right? As long as this uh, top K reviews ranked high enough. After we get these top K reviews, uh, we will look at what are the other phrases that frequently co-occurs with uh, the phrases highlighted in red right, which are the ones that match, matches is a romantic getaway. We may find luxurious bathroom, very clean and spacious room, exceptional service, wonderful staff and service. So we need to do an analysis here to see uh, among the top K reviews, which are the, which are the um, phrases that frequently co-occurs, right? It may turn out that luxurious bathrooms and exceptional service are the phrases that frequently uh, co-occurs with romantic getaway, right? And that's how we interpret it into, into um, exceptional service or uh, luxurious uh, bathroom. Okay, I hope this is clear. So th this slide here shows you some more examples of how we use the co-occurrence method. For example, you may want to look for hotels for our anniversary and that translates to because our schema doesn't have anything that's got to do with anniversary right you will try to interpret it in the best way and the top interpretation will return you uh, this means you are looking for hotels with great stuff right uh, you may ask for hotels with multiple eating options and this will translate to you're looking for hotels with great food where this is really close you may ask for hotels close to public transportation, right? Again, we don't have a schema that directly talks about transportation, public transportation. And uh, this will map actually to grid location of the marker summary location, right? Okay, so uh, if the co-occurrence method also fails to uh, produce um, uh, markers in the schema that frequently occurs with that phrase, we will apply the traditional uh, information retrieval technique here. Um, here, what we do here now is simply take all the reviews of each hotel, make them into one big document D, right? And then compute the Okapi uh, BM25. This is a standard uh, similarity score between the document D and the predicate. So just find the hotel which uh, are ranked highest according to these uh, measures. Okay, oops, um, yeah. So let's go back to our big picture here. We have uh, talked about this part on predicate interpretation. After this step, uh, you have mapped all the phrases to uh, markers of marker summaries, or you have gotten some scores based on the Okapi uh, uh, score. Right. After that, you will compute the degrees of truth for each hotel uh, before you do a fuzzy aggregation here. So um, how do we compute the degrees of truth for each interpreted uh, predicate? And what does uh, degrees of truth mean? Right. So intuitively, when I say um, I want to compute the degrees of truth of each hotel, 
I mean the following, how well does my marker summary represent the phrase that was asked, okay? So what is the degree of truth of the representation of the reviews of the hotel according to what the user is asking? Um, so yeah, so how well does the marker summary represent the query predicate? So here, what we do to get the degree of truth is to actually train a simple uh, log logistic regression model uh, based on the following triples, right? For example, um, the marker summary room cleanliness will pass in a number of phrases. Uh, this is crowdsourced to get the labels, uh, whether the workers will think uh, the room cleanliness marker summary is representative of this phrase, right? It has really clean rooms, right? So this from, from the crowdsourcing work, we will get a bunch of lab labels and then we will build a logistic regression model plus some other features that we use. And the loss function of this uh, logistic regression model is used as the degree of truth. It can tell us how true it is that uh, the room is really clean when compared against the marker summary room cleanliness. Okay. So uh, after that, uh, we, after we compute the degrees of truth, you can now think that every of this mapping has a number associated with it, which is the degrees of truth, right? For example, this mapping has really clean rooms to the room cleanliness marker summary will have uh, a score of 0.7, right? Means that uh, we agree that this phrase is represented by this hotel's marker summary of very clean pretty well. Right. Remember that some hotels may be really clean and some hotels actually may be dirty. So for this hotel, it happens to have a 0.7 representation according to the user's uh, predicate. All right. For some other hotels, the score may be lower because, um, because the marker summary may actually uh, indicate that the hotel is rather dirty. Right. So uh, same for service, exceptional, right? we may get 0.63 and bathroom luxurious, we may get 0.82. Now we need to remember the original uh, query asked for has really clean rooms and is a romantic getaway. So now we need to combine all these uh, interpretations together uh, to form a final uh, score for this hotel, right? And uh, to do this, we use a, a, a variant of fuzzy logic whose uh, logic is shown here right, where for conjunction, we really take uh, the multiplication of the degrees of truth. For negation, we take one minus the degree of truth. And for disjunction, we take the, uh, the, the standard um, uh, um, formula that we will use, where it's one minus, one minus degree of x times degree of y, one minus degree of y, okay? So, uh, you may ask also why we use uh, fuzzy logic here as opposed to just setting some threshold, which is what most people will do, right? And by that, I mean, um, you will insist, for example, only if the hotel's uh, room cleanliness is, um, degree, the degree of truth is greater than 0.7, then I'll consider it true. And uh, only if the luxuriousness is greater than 0.6, then I'll consider it true, right? Um, uh, this is uh, certainly possible, but it's going to return you uh, uh, answers that are not so flexible. And by that, I mean, what happens if you have a hotel that is extremely clean, right, but perhaps uh, not so luxurious? And the other most, more, I think, compelling example is you're looking for a hotel with price here less than 150, but what if your hotel exceeds the price by a few dollars? Per night, right? Are you going to straight away reject uh, that hotel? Uh, I think we should still consider it. And that's where uh, using fuzzy logic actually helps here. Uh, it actually um, may still consider hotels that slightly uh, are below the threshold, but maybe compensates by having a higher uh, degree of satisfaction in other predicates. All right, so um, I've really talked about this part of the uh, picture here on how to answer um, subjective queries against uh, subjective databases. I'm only going to go through um, this part very quickly uh, because it's only semi-automated, right? Someone has to decide in the end what comes into this schema, right? 
So the first thing you do is to construct uh, linguistic domains from reviews. Remember, each subjective attribute has a set of uh, linguistic domains. And for this, we extract aspects and opinions from hotels exhaustively. Right, so aspects and opinions means like room is an aspect, opinion means like very clean or very dirty, right? Bathrooms, uh, luxurious, these are all aspects and opinions. So, from these reviews, we pull out all the extracts opinion. And, um, but one immediate issue we faced was that, uh, you know, there is no um, uh, good way of really uh, trying to do this really well. And uh, oops. and what we did was to use, um, uh, like everybody else uh, today, use a pre-trained bird model on uh, with some labels that we created, and we could do the extraction uh, pretty well. This uh, and and actually uh, since then we have actually developed our own in-house extractor, uh, which is uh, doing uh, pretty, uh, I would say, uh, beating this quite a number of state of the arts in aspect opinion extraction. Okay, so um, after that, you need to design these subjective attributes. How do you come up with room cleanliness, um, uh, st bathroom styles, and so on, right? This is where um, there is a little bit of manual work coming in, right? Um, you can come up, someone has to come up with a set of, uh, or look at this um, set of uh, extracted aspect opinion pairs and try to derive uh, cluster them and understand what would be the potential subjective attributes, right? So I'm going to skip this part. Um, and someone also has to define what would be uh, the markers, right? In the marker summary, uh, is a one easy way to do this is actually for the linearly ordered domains to simply sort the linguistic variations by sentiment analysis and then pick representative points in this, uh, in this uh, uh, linear order, right? And for categorical domains, you can uh, cluster them according to k-means. Um, yeah, so uh, the calculation of the marker summaries, you have to also map linguistic variations, all these phrases from reviews to markers. And uh, then we use a, a form of similarity scores and uh, we have to aggregate um, the similarity scores to form the histograms uh, that you've seen earlier. Okay, so there are lots of work on uh, aspect opinion mining, uh, more than I can list, uh, I mean, just lots and lots, um, trust me. So uh, I'm gleaning over here, uh, but there's also a lot of uh, uh, work on subjective uh, knowledge-based construction, uh, and this is one of the more recent work. Um, also a lot of work in the NLP community on uh, extraction of opinions and uh, knowledge-based construction also, right? So here um, is the screenshot of the demo we have. Uh, I don't know why it's in black and white. I thought I had a version uh, in color. I think I must have put a, an older version, but nonetheless, it's, it's, a, it's the same thing on the top. Uh, you can write your subjective predicates, okay? Here is uh, $200 to $350 per night. You want quiet hotels, friendly staff, free parking near Golden Gate Bridge, right? And you type in these predicates, uh, you will get a ranked list of hotels shown at the, uh, here on the bottom, uh, on the left, right? So, um, and this is ranked according to the scheme that I've just um, told you. Now, uh, you can get some justification on um, why this hotel is shown. If you hover over the quiet attribute, right, you will get some justification of phrases from reviews that mention that this is a great hotel, very quiet, spacious, clean, well kept, very quiet rooms, and so on, right? You will also get some uh, what we call salient facts. Uh, coming from the hotel reviews or so, right? These are interesting facts that you would, you would not know if you had not spent time, say, reading the hotel reviews or if someone didn't write it on the hotel's website, right? So, for example, this uh, Monte Crist Cristo Inn is actually 10 minutes walk away from the uh, Presidio, 
right? It's one of the oldest neighborhood in San Francisco, right? And there's a 24 hour airport shuttle available. So these are useful information to know. And that's uh, listed here, okay? So uh, I think that this uh, almost at the end, right? The key takeaways of this talk is that uh, language is by nature very subjective and uh, nuanced and imprecise. Uh, so we can do all the extraction work, but we still have to spend time um, uh, interpreting them, organizing them before we can uh, systematically answer subjective queries uh, over subjective data. And the novelty, OpineDB is the name of subjective database. The novelty here is that um, in OpineDB, right, we're dealing with subjectivity in both ends. We have subjective data and subjective query, and we're trying to answer queries over subjective data. Uh, and implicitly, we're doing the aggregates and joins uh, through, the, through the query processing method that we do. And um, we have a schema. A lot of the question, query answering techniques from the NLP domain, for example, uh, they will uh, tackle the problem by trying to find spans of text in the reviews to serve as the answer, but they do not aggregate these results for you. They do not, certainly do not join these results for you, right? And we have a schema and a schema turned out to be useful uh, for organizing our uh, uh, organizing the the extractions of aspects and opinions uh, into linguistic domains and market summaries. So uh, for future work, uh, we're definitely considering how to extend this uh, system further to handle user profiles and preferences. There are also lots of uh, subtleties in the reviews, as I've shown you an example earlier. Some reviews sh perhaps should be discarded because they don't mean much, right? So some reviews may be biased, right? So uh, we are definitely into pointing out interesting facts, right? And summarizing thousands of reviews and to be able to explain the observations that we make also. Um, the ultimate search experience is this, right? Uh, we should be able to, in the end, right? Uh, if we have an ideal uh, subjective database system is to come to the system and write a, a and mention a really vague query. For example, I, my, my kids have a week off on February 19. I want to spend, have a good time with them. What should I do, right? This is in a travel domain, right? These days, in the past, we have uh, travel agents. These days, we have websites packaging all these uh, experience packages for you, right? But there should be an automated way to serve this vague request, and perhaps in, uh, in, a, question, uh, in a conversational style, right? The second one is another example, uh, which is very typical of um, uh, students um, entering college or graduating from college looking for jobs, right? Uh, they, they often pose very vague requests. Like I like digital design, I'm pretty good at math and biology. Which, what should I major in, in college, right? Or this advisory system. Uh, and that's the end of my talk. Wang Chiu, thank you very much for this interesting and, as always, extremely clear talk. We offer you a virtual <laughs> round of applause. Thank you. Uh, uh, I hope you can stay a few minutes uh, for yeah. questions. In fact, yeah. there is already a question that uh, Sel Finkelstein asked uh, in the minutes document. Uh, Sel, would you like to ask your question? Mm -hmm. uh, I'll, sure, I'll ask it in parts because it's actually fairly long. H have you combined subjective together with confidence? For example, confidence in a reviewer might be higher if the reviewer stayed at a hotel more often or more recently, and a reviewer might be regarded as more reliable if their reviews of other things frequently match consensus views, particularly for similar things. For example, a coffee review might be more credible if the reviewer was an Alonha Levy level uh, coffee expert. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really good question. Yeah, and this is a really valid and really good question. And as I've hinted earlier, there should be some pre-processing of the reviews uh, before we answer queries. I think that would be the right thing to do. For example, right, uh, another thing that commonly occurs in hotels is some hotels may be undergoing renovations at some point uh, in the timeline. And you may get folks complaining that the hotel is really noisy. Right, but after the renovations are done, these uh, complaints don't surface anymore. Right, so 
for someone who's looking for hotels at the time later, right, we should be uh, dismissing all the hotels, uh, I mean, all the reviews that mention that the hotel is noisy because of the renovations, because that's been completed, right? So that, there should be some uh, uh, pre-processing of the reviews to get rid of noise, uh, as, you, as you suggested rightly, right? And there would be reviewers who are pretty harsh, right? There would be reviewers who are pretty lenient, and uh, this would be need, I mean, some more sophisticated mechanism would need to be in place to identify these people uh, who may um, uh, unknowingly bias the, the, the histogram in one way or another, right? In, in fact, I ask a similar follow-up. Uh, going further, terminology might be individually subjective. Good could be a positive review term from some reviewers, but a mediocre review from others. An analysis similar to what you've already done might determine you know, which is which. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So what I say, so when I say I'm looking for really clean hotels, maybe different from someone else uh, looking for really clean hotels. Clean is very subjective between me and another person, right? Also, it's also the query side and the review side. The both sides we need to um, need to be able to handle. Uh, the subjectivity. Thank you. Yeah. I do not see other questions in the minutes, but uh, if uh, participants have uh, questions, they can ask now. I have a question, but I'll ask it after other people ask. There, yeah, there I think, is one more uh, question from Sui Chen. Uh, yeah. Oh, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Xiao. Uh, uh, hi, Professor Tan. Uh, so I have two questions. And the first one, as you mentioned, the threshold when you calculate the similarity between the representations. And I want to ask, how do you determine the threshold? Especially when you have different domain, you may want different thresholds for the similarities. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Yeah, so for now, uh, the threshold, we determine it uh, on our own. Right, but someone has to be there to, to determine the, the, the threshold. You're absolutely right. I don't have a magic formula on what is the right way to do it for each domain, uh, but it's, it also depends on how, how quickly you want to fall back to the co-occurrence method, right? Or how much you want to insist on mapping with the word embedding method, right? So uh, I don't have a straight answer for you, but it's a really good question, yeah. Okay, thank you. And then uh, I have another question. That is, you also mentioned that you use the k-means to find the categories. However, when you use the k-means, you have to specify the k. And how do you find out the k? Uh, yeah, that's the human's job to find the k. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's a really good question. Yeah, so I don't have a formula for k. Uh, in the end, is is a lot of judgment from this. Uh, it's like someone designing a database schema, that person also has to use a judgment on what, uh, what should go in the schema, right? How to split the relations. Um, here, uh, if we have a query workload, that may be guided by the query workload also, right? The other subtlety is in the marker summary itself, uh, you can choose four markers or you can choose 10 markers, right? So the granularity is also up to the, the the, the person who designed the schema and, um, and it does affect the outcome of the query depending on the granularity of your marker, markers. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Tsekwe. And I'm sorry, I had not scrolled uh, enough to see that we had asked the question after Sel's question. Okay, no worries. A any other questions? Hi, hi, won't you? This is Jeff Fever. It's nice to, nice hi, to see you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I had a related question to that about the marker summaries, right? Is there a, uh, it sounds like, you know, they're statically defined. And I was wondering how maybe, uh, do you have a method like to curate them? So in other words, like uh, if you start having uh, difficulties matching, you know, the freeform text to the, the labels, is, is, is there some way to send it, expand them or to know that you need more or fewer? Is there any way to measure that? Yeah, so if you have a query workload that will guide, definitely help guide the, the granularity of the marker summary. Uh, for example, uh, one extreme case is you, you may just design uh, room cleanliness as clean, dirty, 
just two markers, right? So certainly in this case, if now a query comes in and asks for uh, very clean rooms, right? Um, uh, only if only if the hotel has a lot of reviews with very clean, that will represent the user's query well. Now, if you have a hotel that uh, a lot of times says, okay, decently clean, you may get all of them still lumped under clean. Mm -hmm. you, you see what I'm saying? And, and for that reason, you may misrepresent the hotel, right? Thinking that it's clean when actually it's not, right? right. And answer the uh, user's query wrongly. So, so if we have a query workload, uh, if you have a lot of queries, for example, about the cleanliness of rooms coming in different linguistic form, you may just want to be more careful about the granularity. I would say more finer grain uh, granularity will be better, right? But if you have queries uh, just asking whether uh, the hotel is good or not, right? Then you can stay with a pretty coarse grain uh, uh, marker summary. That's my that's my two cents. Yeah, but uh, query workload will help a lot. That's the bottom line. Did I yeah, answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, just if you know, like when you're done, when do you have enough of them that you don't have too many? Yeah. yeah. So sometimes you yeah. may also miss, like the romantic getaway example is not in the. Um, not in the subjective database schema, you may consider adding a marker summary about romantic, uh, roman degree of romantic, uh, the, the, how romantic is the hotel, right? Uh, into, <laughs> into the database schema, because that's a query that is asked very often, right? And then you may want to represent that. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Other questions? If not, uh, once you have a couple of questions. The first is um, a, a technical question, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure you know, even though it was well before your time, that in the mid late 80s, uh, Laura Haas at Almaden led the garlic project. And uh, they dealt with uh, fuzzy queries. And uh, for instance, they wanted uh, 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 cars in a dealership that were red, but of course, there are variations of red. And that's where they introduced uh, a query answering mechanism that involved uh, fuzzy logic. And in fact, Ron Fagin was responsible for developing Fagin's algorithm uh, for aggregating. Did you use some of this technology that was there? Because he's been quite influential in that space. But I haven't seen subsequent use. I, do you know what I'm referring uh, yes, to? Yes, I know what you're referring to. Uh, I, I, I remember this discussion did come up before. Uh, but we did not use it in the end. Um, so when we process the, the, the predicates, uh, it was simply combined with that variant to come out with a final result. The, the harder part was actually to interpret the, each, each predicate, which we, what we did was, uh, as I described, to in, interpret it using this uh, uh, loss function from the logistic regression. I see. Right. So we did not combine using the, the fuzzy uh, aggregation algorithm. The, yeah. Yeah. Right. So. And, and, and the other question is somewhat uh, broader or more philosophical. Uh, they, uh, tools such as these uh, subjective databases are ultimately uh, tools that uh, aid people for decision making, right? And uh, therefore, uh, these days, we are all very conscious of uh, bias and fairness in the <laughs> results that we get. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So did you think about these issues? Because uh, this is a relatively innocuous space, perhaps. But after all, decisions will be made by individuals that may hurt some businesses uh, who may feel they have been treated unfairly as a yeah. result of the aggregation. Yeah. Uh, what do you do? Have you considered this? And or what are your thoughts on about this. So, not in the paper, right? But we certainly have uh, anything that is is being if if it's being discussed to go in production will be sensitive to these issues. And um, uh, the training data matters a lot. Okay, and and the bias we get in this case is directly from the reviews, if any, mm -hmm. right? And uh, that's why it's actually important to to pre-process the reviews too, because some reviews are fake. Uh, we get all this, this um, 
uh, issues going on. Yeah, but but you this, might, is, this, this is related to the confidence issue that the uh, cell correctly raised a minute ago, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. So first of all, the training data matters a lot, right? But in, in a way, the bias already is inherent in the reviews. And the question is whether we want to also um, uh, have methods to um, pre-process these reviews to reduce the bias, right? The other but, thing is uh, to but, be able- but, to, but changing some of the parameters will change the, the answers, right? Yeah, yeah. And the, I was gonna say the other thing is to be able to explain your answers. Yes, yes. Right? Why is this hotel ranked higher than the other? Even if yeah. you can't explain why is this ranked first, right? Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate having you back, even though for a short time. And virtually. <laughs> <laughs> and, and virtually. Well, very, we are all virtual these days, but, uh, yeah. but having you back, uh, thank you very much, Wang Xiu. Yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. We we'll hope you come back for another occasion. <laughs> okay. uh, so we have just a couple of minutes before the next talk, so let's take a short break and uh, we'll resume in, uh, in, uh, one at, at 2.50 for a kid's talk. Wang Xiu, thank you. Uh, our second speaker this afternoon is Akil Dixit, uh, who will speak on consistent query answering via SAT solving. Akil is a, a fifth year uh, doctoral student in the computer science and engineering department. And for the past uh, two years, he has been uh, supported by CROSS uh, in this project, we, which aims to develop a system for uh, answering queries over inconsistent databases uh, using such solvents. So with this, I'll ask uh, Stephanie to kindly start Akil's presentation. Good afternoon. Welcome to the second and the last session of the Aspects of Data Management Workshop. My name is Akhil Dikshit, and I'll be talking about consistent query answering via satisfiability solving. Let me begin with some background. In the relational databases, uh, the database schemas are often accompanied with a set of integrity constraints. For example, uh, they could be key constraints where in a table, a set of attributes uniquely determine the entire row of, of that particular table. Uh, the databases that violate the set of integrity constraints set on their schema are called as inconsistent databases. A toy example could be, let's say you have employees table with four attributes and employee ID is supposed to be a key, but you end up having two rows uh, where the employee ID is the same, 112, uh, which is an inconsistency. In the real world, uh, inconsistencies are pretty much unavoidable, and therefore we must uh, figure out a way to deal with inconsistent databases. There are primarily two approaches to that, the first one being data cleaning. So the idea here is you somehow remove the inconsistencies. Uh, you may want to add new tuples, you, you can delete the existing ones, you may want to update uh, the data itself, uh, to come up with a clean version of the database so that you can run your queries on them. This is the main approach in the industry today, but the criticism that this, this one gets is that this is an ad hoc approach or this is more engineering than science because this often involves making arbitrary choices uh, while cleaning the data. Arguably more principled and more scientific approach is based on the notion of database repairs. And the idea here is you don't clean the dirty data, uh, but you handle the inconsistencies at the time of query evaluation. So let me talk a bit more about database repairs. So this is the notion uh, introduced by Arenas Bertosi and Homichki in 1999. And it states the following. Let's say you have an inconsistent database instance I and uh, it has a set sigma of integrity constraints on it. Now you say that a database instance J is a repair of I uh, if the following three conditions hold. The first one is J should be a subset of I. So if you view the databases as sets of tuples, you can talk about these subset relationships. So J should be a subset of I. 
Second condition is J should be consistent. That is, it should follow all integrity constraints uh, on its schema, on, in sigma. Uh, and there should be no other database J prime such that J prime is consistent. And J is a subset of J prime and J prime is a subset of I. So in some sense, this is enforcing a minimality condition. That is, you're allowed to delete uh, the tuples from I to come up with a database J, but you can only delete a minimal number of tuples. You can't delete too much and say that now I have a repair. Uh, so in other words, a repair of an inconsistent database is a maximal consistent subset of that particular database. These, uh, this, this notion of database repairs is used to give the semantic meaning to query answering over inconsistent databases. And this is called consistent answers. The idea is you take the intersection of the answers to the query or evaluated over each of the repairs. So pictorially, this could be uh, uh, said like this. So let's say you have an inconsistent database instance I. Clearly, there is uh, there's not a unique way to repair a given database. There, there could be many uh, repairs. Let's say J1, J2, dot, 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 Jn. Now, you have a query Q. You evaluate it on J1. You get answers Q of J1. Similarly, you get uh, sets of answers Q of J2 and so on up to Q of Jn. And then you take the intersection of those and you have the consistent answers to Q on the original database instance I. The strong semantic guarantee that you get from consistent answers uh, that, you, that you in fact don't get from data cleaning is that no matter how you repair your database, your consistent answers are going to remain the same. Consistent query answering or CQA is a problem of computing the consistent answers on a given inconsistent database. It is often studied for conjunctive queries, also known as select project join or SPJ queries. So in SQL, uh, these are select from where type of queries. So uh, even for these simple queries, and for simple key constraints, uh, it has been shown this, that computing consistent answers can be an intractable problem. That is, uh, it is very unlikely to have an efficient algorithm uh, that computes consistent answers. And you can see why. I mean, the reason is uh, there are simply too many repairs. In general, there can be exponentially many repairs for a given inconsistent database. For example, let's say you have a, a table R with two attributes A and B, and the first attribute is a key. And uh, in your database instance I, uh, first two tuples violate the key because they have value A1 uh, for the key attribute. And again, third and the fourth uh, tuples also violate because they share the key attribute with value A2. So clearly, this particular database instance has four repairs. Uh, and, and you can see if you continue this pattern, uh, you can have exponentially many repairs in the size of the database. And that causes the intractability of, uh, that may cause the intractability of, of consistent answers. Uh, conjunctive queries that have simple yes or no answers are called Boolean conjunctive queries. These are also uh, the ones, I mean, precisely the ones that have no free variables. Uh, the problem of computing consistent answer to a Boolean conjunctive query is, is now a decision problem that's called certainty of Q. Uh, and it, it asks, given a database instance I, is cons of Q, comma I, comma sigma true? And let's look at some Boolean conjunctive queries. Let's say you have, again, two tables R and S with two attributes each, and the first attribute of each of the tables being a key. Let's say uh, you look at a path query. This is like uh, you're asking for a path of length two. So you're looking for an existence of uh, three values x, y, z, such that x, y is present in table R and y, z present in table S. So in SQL, this could be a query select one from a R, com R and S, where you equate the attributes R dot B and S dot C. Interestingly, 
computing consistent answers to this query is SQL rewritable. That is, you can compute the consistent answers uh, within an SQL engine, within a database engine. Uh, now, let's say another example. It's a very similar query, but the difference is in the join condition. So let's say it's a query select one from, again, these two tables R and S. But instead of equating attributes B and C, this time we equate B and D. So you say where R dot B equals S dot D. Uh, interestingly, computing certain answer or consistent answer to this query is co NP complete. Let's, let me say a little bit more about uh, SQL rewritability and, and co NP completeness. So as I said, for a conjunctive query Q, uh, SQL rewritability means that you can you can come up with another query Q prime such that evaluating Q prime on the inconsistent database will directly give you the consistent answers to the original query. So for example, let's say your query is uh, select e1.name. So, so let's say you have a table employees or E with three attributes and your query is you want to find out the names of employees uh, that belong to city London. You can rewrite this query uh, to compute the consistent answers. You can say select e1.name from e as e1, where e1.city is London, and not exists, select star from e as e2, where you equate on the key attributes, e2.id equals e1.id, and e2.city is not equal to London. So you see adding this uh, not exists condition, this additional condition, uh, is like filtering out the answers that are not consistent. And that's why a Q prime uh, on the inconsistent database I will directly give you the consistent answers to Q. But of course, as I said, this is not true for all queries. So there are many uh, conjunctive queries for which no efficient algorithm is known. Uh, and that will remain like that unless P equals NP. Uh, so this was a little bit about uh, theory uh, regarding consistent query answering. There have been several approaches, uh, several attempts uh, to translate this theory into practical systems for consistent query answering. For example, Hippo, Conquer, uh, Cons, Cons X, and Equip, and, and so on. These were designed specifically to handle uh, different classes of uh, integrity constraints, different types of queries, and they uh, rely on different methods to compute uh, consistent answers. The problem is uh, most of the existing systems remained as academic prototypes for several reasons. And you can see that uh, there is very little work on aggregation queries. So specifically, there is only one system, Conquer, uh, that can handle aggregation queries. But again, the problem with Conquer is that since it is based on SQL rewriting approach, it cannot handle queries that are not, whose consistent answers are not SQL rewritable. So as I said, the ones that may be intractable, the Conquer is not able to handle those. So we decided to uh, come up with our system CAVSAT that stands for consistent answers via satisfiability. Uh, this is a comprehensive and scalable uh, consistent query answering system. Comprehensive in the sense that it can handle broad classes of integrity constraints and broad classes of practical queries at the same time, specifically denial constraints or uh, and, and queries uh, that are arbitrary unions of conjunctive queries that may involve aggregation and groupings. And the system is scalable because we are relying on SAT solving. So we use reductions to SAT and its variants. So uh, let me uh, give a brief background on what is SAT. So in propositional logic, a Boolean formula is an expression uh, constructed using variables, constants, and Boolean operators. And the SAT problem is, is a problem of asking whether given formula is satisfiable or not meaning that uh, is there a truth assignment to the variables of the formula that make the whole formula true. For example, uh, here, is a, here is a Boolean formula phi, and it is in fact satisfiable, and you can see the satisfying assignment 
uh, that you can assign values 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1 uh, to variables A, B, C, D, E, and F respectively, and that will make phi true. Uh, SAT is the most fundamental and most extensively studied NP complete problem. In fact, there is a whole uh, uh, research community that works on building SAT solvers. Uh, that is uh, top of the line softwares that can solve instances of SAT problem uh, very efficiently in practice. So this in this research community has witnessed a tremendous progress that is often termed as SAT revolution. And thanks to advanced algorithms such as conflict driven clause learning and lookahead techniques and several optimizations that today's SAT solvers are capable of, uh, capable of solving instances with over a million variables and over 5 million clauses within a few seconds. And as a result, uh, SAT solvers today are being widely used as the general purpose problem solving tools. And the best part is most of the top notch SAT solvers are open source. So now we have this motivation. So the, the research on CQA has not penetrated the industry. And also now we have this uh, tool, a big tool of SAT solving with us. And we have these natural reductions where we can translate the problem of uh, CQA to variants of SAT. So now uh, that's why we decided to build a comprehensive and uh, scalable consistent query answering system based on SAT solving. This is the architecture of our system. It's a modular system. So on the left, you see a query preprocessor module. It takes the input query and the set of integrity constraints and determines the complexity of computing its consistent answers. And based on that, it forwards the query to one of the uh, next modules. So if, if it is SQL rewritable, then it forwards it to the query rewriting module which rewrites it and then computes the consistent answers within the SQL engine itself. Otherwise, we have the SAT solving modules. So the first SAT solving module is designed for conjunctive queries or SPJ queries. And the second SAT solving module contains several other reductions that are capable of computing consistent answers for aggregation queries. So let me talk a bit uh, more about these reductions. So just to give you the flavor of, of the reductions that I'm, I've been talking about, uh, how do we convert CQA into a SAT instance? So this is a very basic, it, the simplest case. So this is a Boolean conjunctive query and primary key constraints. So what do we do? We look at the database and we look at the sets of tuples that share a key. Uh, and then based on that, we form a clause UJ. Uh, that, that is simply the disjunction of all of these variables associated to the tuples from that set. So this is like this set of clauses capture the inconsistency that, that's present in the database. In the second step, we look at the minimal sets of tuples that satisfy the query. And again, we form sets of clauses, uh, VK, that contain uh, the disjunctions of the negated variables uh, corresponding to the tuples. So this set of clauses captures the, the satisfiability of the query over the data. And now if we take all of these clauses in conjunction and construct a formula phi, uh, we can say it, it's pretty easy to prove that phi is satisfiable if and only if the query Q is false on some repair of I, that is the consistent answer to Q is false. So now you see, you, you take the CQA prop instance, you, you translate it into a, a SAT instance. Now you can give this to a SAT solver, see the answer, and then uh, translate it back into the, the consistent answers that you want. In the real world, uh, queries often involve aggregation functions and possibly uh, group by clauses in SQL. So aggregation and grouping. In fact, uh, the conjunctive queries with aggregation and grouping cover a very broad class of practical queries. Uh, but when you think about computing consistent answers to aggregation queries, the problem is that it is very unlikely that they will have a meaningful consistent answer because 
aggregation query is often likely to evaluate to different answers on different repairs and therefore your intersection of that is going to be empty in most cases so to overcome that uh, arenas uh, et al in 2003 proposed a notion of range consistent answers so this is a slightly modified notion of consistent answers specifically for aggregation queries so let me say a bit more about that too uh, so for an aggregation query range consistent answers is the tightest range that is uh, the greatest lower bound and the least upper bound such that on every repair of the inconsistent database the query evaluates to an answer within that range so it's maybe it's easy to uh, understand this with an example so let's go back to our example of employees table where employee id is a key uh, you see there are two possible repairs of this database the first repair is when you uh, keep tuples one and two but you throw away the third tuple the second repair is when you keep tuples one and three but throw away tuple two let's say your aggregation query is you want to count the number of employees for each role if we evaluate this query directly on the inconsistent database it will tell you that there are two software engineers and one software intern it's easy to see uh, but this is misleading because if you repair the data these numbers are no longer correct so the range consistent answers say that instead of simply evaluating the query you you give the range and the range says that uh, for software engineer the range is 1,2 that is no matter how you repair this particular database you are guaranteed to find at least one software engineer and at most two software engineers similarly uh, there is a repair where there is no software intern that is uh, the lower bound is zero but you are guaranteed that uh, no matter how you repair you will find at most one software engineer a software intern that's a range consistent answers so we found several natural reductions uh, from range consistent semantic uh, range semantic consistent answers to uh, variants of sat and these reductions depend on again uh, aggregation functions and presence or absence of groupings and so on and then we deploy a suitable sat solver uh, to solve these instances so just to show you briefly uh, based on the type of the query so starting with unions of conjunctive queries going up to unions of conjunctive queries with aggregation and grouping uh, we reduce this problem of consistent answers to variants of sat so again starting with plain boolean sat to weighted partial max sat iterative partial max sat and, and so on and then we use uh, uh, the corresponding suitable solvers so glucose and lingaling are like plain sat solvers max hs and min sat z uh, can handle instances of max sat and min sat and, and some variants like those with this i would like to show a quick demo of capsat so so that you can understand uh, what uh, what do what we can do uh, with such all so this is a user interface as you can see on top right i am currently connected to an sql server a database on sql server on my laptop it's actually a tpch database uh, that has over 12 million tuples i believe and if you look at uh, the schema and raw data you see there are tables like customer line table nation and so on so let's say uh, you want to quickly uh, find out uh, let's say this is a query uh, you want to find out phone numbers of the customers uh, that belong to canada so when you evaluate the query this gives you the consistent answers uh, that are computed by a partial maxat solving and as you can see there are uh, 10727 rows that are consistent and if you see the potential answers these are the answers uh, when you evaluate the query directly on the inconsistent database these are the answers that you get and these are more than 11900 answers so you see out of all these only 10727 are are the consistent ones and if you look at the query analysis 
uh, you can see on the left that this query is in fact rewritable, SQL rewritable. So you can see uh, uh, the, the SQL rewritings uh, from several different algorithms. So this is the SQL rewriting given by Conquer. This is given by another algorithm and so on. Now, maybe let's look at an example uh, of a query that is not uh, SQL rewritable. This is a slightly complex query that asks for the names of the customers uh, from Brazil, uh, such that th th those customers are also themselves the suppliers to some other customers. If you execute this query, uh, you get a set of customers. Uh, these customers uh, are, are also suppliers. And if you look at the query analysis, you see the data complexity of computing consistent answers with this query is in fact co-NP complete. And this is due to the fact that uh, we have this very nice tool called attack graph. So uh, from a query, you can, you can build this attack graph. And the idea here is uh, properties of cycles in the attack graph uh, give you an idea uh, that, that the properties tell you uh, the complexity of the query. So you see there is a cycle between the nodes, customer and supplier, which are the tables participating in the query. And because of this cycle, uh, this query is, is co-NP complete. And finally, let's look at a query uh, that involves some aggregation and grouping as well. So let's say uh, you want to count the number of suppliers uh, grouped by uh, the nation. So for every country, you want uh, to compute how many suppliers are there. Now, queries with uh, grouping take a little bit time uh, to compute consistent answers because, because, of, uh, because we need the iterative algorithm. So for each group, we need to compute, we need to construct and then solve a SAT instance for, for each of them. So yeah. So you see here, uh, let's say, let's look at the first row, that's Brazil. The greatest lower bound is 728 and the lowest upper bound is 787, meaning that no matter how you repair your data, you're guaranteed that there will be at least 728 suppliers from Brazil and at most 787 suppliers from Brazil. With that, uh, let me go back to the presentation. Uh, so conjunctive queries, I mean, I have been talking a lot about conjunctive queries and primary keys, uh, but conjunctive queries capture a practical, but still a limited class of queries. And similarly, primary keys are also important, but still a limited class of integrity constraints. So though we started out with conjunctive queries and primary keys, uh, we can extend these. Uh, we managed to, in fact, uh, stretch this to unions of conjunctive queries with aggregation and grouping and over the databases that are inconsistent with respect to arbitrary denial constraints. So in some sense, uh, this, is, this is how much you can push with, with SAT solving. We have some experimental results uh, and for the sake of time, I'm not including them in this presentation, but uh, you're welcome to see our paper or even in the Q&A session, I, I, can, I can show some results. Uh, to summarize, uh, the framework of database repairs provides a principled approach uh, to deal with inconsistencies. Uh, there is a lot of progress in uh, CQA theory, but uh, it hasn't penetrated the industry uh, because there's no comprehensive CQA system uh, yet. Uh, and given the advancements in SAT solving and the several, several natural reductions that we found, CAVSAT seems to be a promising approach. And in the future work, uh, we are planning to compare CAVSAT to a state-of-the-art data cleaning system such as HoloClean. Uh, this is a challenging task because data cleaning and consistent query answering are fundamentally different approaches to deal with inconsistencies. And therefore, this first requires us to bring these two approaches on the same platform where we can have a meaningful comparison. So this, this is what we are working on right now. And with this, I think I'll, I'll end my talk and I'm happy to take any questions if you have. Thank you so much for listening. Akil, thank you very much for your presentation. We offer you virtual applause as well.
uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's uh, time for questions. I do not see any questions in the minutes, but uh, uh, if uh, participants uh, have questions, please unmute yourself and ask. Okay, any, any questions? Any? All right, it's, I guess it's a long day. Okay. So, uh, Akil, thank you again. This uh, then concludes, uh, concludes this, uh, this session of the Aspects of Data Management Workshop. And uh, let me thank all of you for being here and uh, thank again CROSS for organizing this and in particular for supporting uh, Akil's uh, research for the past uh, two years. Thank you very much.